Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Danielle Guercho. I'm the content manager at the ArcView Group, and welcome to ArcView Access, the beverage biz breakdown. As a former bartender and legacy baker, this category is so dear to me. It's such a huge part of my personal cannabis journey. 10 years ago, I was making infused pina coladas in secret, and today I'm hosting some of the brightest stars in the space to talk about the incredible innovations and trends they create. What a time. Our digital programs filled the need for community building and education when 2020 came about, giving ArcView a valuable tool for networking, connection, and most importantly, learning about our industry one corner at a time. Before we dive in, I'm just gonna give you a quick rundown of the ArcView group. Under the ArcView group's umbrella are five units, each uniquely positioned to support our growing industry from the ground up. ArcView Capital handles your financial needs as a FINRA registered broker, and now includes a crowdfunding platform. Our ventures team is the principal investing group managing our unique collective fund made up of 78 members and they call the shots. Our consulting team is your portal to scaling and building your business, no matter what the size. And they also handle state expansion down to licensing evaluations. We also just launched RFP marketing services now available to help with your branding, marketing and lead gen needs. Last up, ArcView Events and Experiences, which is my team, so excited. We partnered with McVeigh Global Meetings and Events in a joint venture to bring you this webinar today and to make our in-person events like New York City in October even more special. We also wanna say thanks to our strategic alliance partners, all cannabis professionals with great resources for our sector, including Alpha Root, who handles insurance, Ice Miller Legal Group, Olives, who has POS services, Green Tank Technologies, Work, who handles HR and payroll, PayQuick, who does banking and treasury services, and also financial consulting from Waterton Partners. And we also just made a data partnership with Hoodie Analytics, who will be giving us a briefing on the sector. So I'm now gonna kick it over to Kelly Bernatha Hall, who is the EVP of Client Success at Hoodie, and she's gonna give us some context on cannabis beverages. Great, thanks, Danielle. Hi, everyone, I'm Kelly Bernatha Hall with Hoodie Analytics. I head up customer success here for Hoodie. I have over 17 years of experience in analytics and insights, starting a long time ago in the CPG space, working for the Nielsen company. Uh, but I've been in the cannabis space, working closely with dispensaries, MSOs, brands, uh, uh, addressing questions around assortment, pricing, and promotion needs uh, for the last three to four years. So very happy to be here, very happy to share uh, all about beverages. I know there's a lot of excitement to get to the panel, so we'll make this short and sweet, but want to ground you in, in some details of what's happening right now in the market. Go to the next slide, please. So, Hoody Analytics is all about delivering current stocking status, assortment, pricing, and promotion information every day to our clients. Uh, we're not the only ones out there providing data and analytics, but we are the only ones that can provide next day turnaround on key data points. Um, you, you know, we're going out there and aggregating with broad coverage across all the states uh, that have, a, you know, the medical or adult use um, allowed and being able to provide near real-time information around what's happening in that market so you can make better decisions even faster. Next slide, please. All of that data that we've got that we're pulling off of menus around assortment, pricing, and promotion powers our suite of services. We've got our competitive intelligence dashboards and our recently launched sales enablement app to really help our, our, our clients understand marketplace trends, dispensary analytics, as well as promotional and brand development. Uh, we've also, you have our data that powers store and product locators so that your customers can find your brand and products accurately without needing to search and surf uh, for the products that they're looking for. But specifically for today, we're taking all of the great data that we have at our fingertips and looking closer at the beverage segment. So let's get into taking a look at what's happening within beverage. Next slide, please. So let's look first at where we see growth. And specifically, we're looking at this from the concept of distribution, looking to understand distribution trends, what's growing, and what's happening in the market. Distribution, as all of you I'm sure know, is a leading indicator, it tends to be highly correlated with sales. You have to be someplace that a consumer can find you and, and buy you. So it's really key to get as much distribution as possible. And at Hoodie, we look at distribution with a concept of 
TDPs or total distribution points. So really getting a sense of uh, both the breadth of distribution, how many dispensaries is a particular category or brand or what have you is in, as well as the depth of distribution, how many items are actually on a menu. Looking here on the left-hand side, we can see both the size of categories across cannabis products, uh, vape, pre-rolls, edibles, concentrates, et cetera, in the gray bars. And you can see the growth in distribution that we've seen over the last six months or so um, for those categories as well. I think no surprise here, edibles is uh, one of the top growing uh, categories, one of the larger categories as well. Beverages is up and coming, right? Beverages is part of the edibles category. It's maybe smaller in terms of total distribution points today, but it's also one of the faster growing from a distribution perspective. As we look on the right-hand side, you can see within edibles, uh, beverages is the second fastest growing from a distribution perspective, only, fall, only um, being beat by, uh, by gummies. If we go to the, the next slide. This growth that we're seeing in distribution isn't happening in just one state or just one region. We're really seeing a growth in the beverage category across the country. Uh, even in really established markets, such as the, the, West, the West region, if you will, um, we're still seeing growth in the beverage, in the beverage um, category. In the East, we're seeing growth, and the Midwest has really blown, blown both, both regions out of the water here with 40% growth over the last six months in, in beverages. Now, you can see at the bottom of the pie chart here, uh, you know, the, there's a similar profile across all of these regions, too. Uh, certainly, we've got your ready-to-drink beverage options and you also have mix options as well. Certainly you can see the balance of items and the share of items on menus across these different regions, ready to drink really leading the way uh, with mixed products um, making up a, a smaller portion. That middle chart in the right in the middle uh, gives you a little bit of perspective on you know what kind of growth opportunity might still exist and in particular in the Midwest and the East, here we're looking at the share of, of items on menus nationally, you can see that beverages isn't at their fair share yet, right? So as much as we're seeing growth in distribution from, um, from the Midwest and for the East, there's still an opportunity for even more, even more growth uh, to really get capture at least your fair share um, in, in the marketplace itself. The next slide, please. Now, as we look for some common, th common threads, common themes in terms of beverage growth, we see a couple of things pop up. Again, just like we just saw, it's not just one state or one region that's driving the growth. There's really a lot of different things that are happening within beverage, which makes it so exciting. From a brand perspective, it's not just coming from MSOs. It's not just coming from local brands, but there's a mix of, of who's growing in the states, uh, which, which brands are, are top from a distribution perspective. Um, so a, there's a nice mix across, uh, across the states in terms of who's, who's leading there. On the dosage side, there's you know, certainly our low dose, social, sessionable type of products, but we're also seeing some higher dose options coming onto the market as well. So there's really gonna be more variety there, more choice for consumers to choose from. Continuing on the variety theme, uh, formats have really exploded as well in recent years. So beyond sodas and seltzers and tonics, you also see forms like shots, teas, water, punches, et cetera. You know, the mixes side, that's also really um, exploded as well in terms of the liquid drops, powders, tea bags, et cetera. So a wide variety of formats, a wide variety of options as consumers enter this particular category. And then beyond the benefits of beverage um, THC products, there's also added benefits, added, added features that are also included now in some of those products that are available in market. For example, Tonic has a vitamin water line, um, that, that includes B6 or B12 or C vitamins in the drinks. You know, you've, you've got claims now around zero sugar, no sugar, low calories as well um, to further enhance and entice consumers um, to, to try new beverage products in the marketplace. There's a lot of excitement within beverages, rightfully so, given the amount of variety, given the amount of interest in um, folks using different types of cannabis products in different formats um, in, their, in their everyday life. So I would be happy to continue the conversation with anyone who's so interested in talking about beverages more. Um, happy to go to the next slide, please. 
Um, if you have any questions, please reach out to me. My email is here, at Kelly at Hootie Analytics. Happy to talk with you about beverages or any questions you might have in the data space for, for cannabis in particular. But with that, I would very happy now to start, start the program. And I'm very honored to introduce Rachel Birkins, who will be moderating the panel today. Thank you, Kelly. Hi, everybody. I'm Rachel Burkhans, and I'm very excited to be here. And thank you so much to ArcView for tackling one of my favorite topics in cannabis. There's going to be so much to explore here today, as Kelly just walked through. It's a very dynamic, very quickly moving space, and a lot is happening. So with a little bit of background about me before we get started and getting to know our panelists, um, I spent more than a decade working in the wine and spirit space before co-founding my cannabis hospitality company, Altered Plates, in 2015 where I'm currently working on opening a consumption lounge space in the city of West Hollywood, California, and where I know cannabis beverages will be able to have a really meaningful impact immediately. I'm also the editor-in-chief of The Clever Root, which is a digital publication designed to really explore the potential of cannabis beverages and cannabis food and hospitality generally. And I'm also really excited to announce that I'm the head cannabis judge of the High Spirits Awards, which is the first of its kind cannabis beverage competition created by the LA Spirits Awards and launching in 2023 and is really just reflective of the ways in which traditional beverage is really beginning to look at cannabis beverages much more closely. So we will definitely touch on all of those topics more meaningfully, but first let's get to know our panelists a little bit. I'd like to first throw it over to my very dear friend, Jamie Evans, founder of the Herbsom and Herbasti. Thank you, Rachel, and a big thank you to ArcView and all of our guests for joining us today. So as Rachel mentioned, my name is Jamie Evans. I'm the founder of The Herb Psalm. And if you haven't heard of The Herb Psalm before, it is a culinary meets cannabis blog and lifestyle brand um, that really focuses on the gourmet side of the industry. So I launched this blog back in 2017 and it has grown a since then. So I'm probably best known for my wine and weed experiences and now my wine and weed beverage <laughs> here in Northern California, but I'm also the author of two different books. Um, the first one is The Ultimate Guide to CBD, which came out in 2020. And I'm also the author of Cannabis Drinks, Secrets to Crafting CBD and THC Beverages at Home. And alongside my work in the cannabis space, I'm a certified sommelier with over a decade of wine industry experience. And when working in wine, I had the opportunity to work with some amazing organizations and wineries, including Jackson Family Wines, uh, the Napa Valley Grape Growers, and Folio Fine Wine Partners, which was an importing company um, owned by Michael Mandavi and his family. And so when I was working in wine, I really specialized in wine marketing, public relations, and sales. So really leaning into what I learned in the wine industry at the end of 2021, I launched the cannabis-infused beverage brand called Herb Bossy, which is a non-alcoholic uh, cannabis-infused sparkling wine line that really honors French-inspired wine blends. And our first product, our sparkling rosé, um, is a sparkling rosé type product um, that hit Northern California earlier this year. So it's just been an incredible journey so far, and I am a big lover of cannabis beverages. So happy to be here today. Thank you, Jamie. All right, next we'll throw it over to Ben Larson, CEO of Vertosa. Ben, tell us a little bit about you and Vertosa. Uh, sure. Uh, thanks, Rachel. And hey, everyone. Um, yeah, so Vertosa is an ingredient technology company. Uh, we've been dedicated to helping grow the, the beverage space for the last four years. Um, I also uh, might be known for hosting the Marijuana Today podcast. Um, I'm a board member for NCIA and uh, just got back from a week in DC trying to get safe banking passed. Uh, so fingers crossed there. Um, I'm a founding board member for the Cannabis Beverage Association, as well as the Cannabis Beverage Council for Attach. And yeah, I'm a dad. Uh, so that takes up the rest of my time. <laughs> that sounds like you got your hands pretty full there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, next we'll throw it over to Darnell Smith, CEO of a really cool brand called Moon. Darnell, tell us a little bit about you and Moon. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Rachel. I'm uh, glad to join uh, uh, some friends on this panel. Um, and thanks to our view for having me. I'm, as uh, Rachel said, I'm Darnell Smith. I'm the founder 
of Moon. We are a non-alcoholic cannabis-infused spirit, right? That's intended to be a one-to-one -one replacement for alcohol spirits you already know and love. Think gin, bourbon, tequila. We uh, have all the tastes sans the alcohol uh, plus the cannabis uh, to make basically any cocktail that you know, you're familiar with. Um, and so I spent a large share of my career uh, in beverage innovation, uh, doing it for the likes of Diageo, Pernod Ricard, uh, Bacardi Incubation, um, the list goes on. And um, for me, this is a, a true evolution of, of beverage, um, just kind of seeing where the data was moving and kind of seeing where uh, consumer habits were shifting. And so Moon is really targeted at being a kind of foolproof way to experience uh, cannabis cocktails with uh, uh, not a lot of uh, work required or heavy lifting required on the end of the consumer. Awesome. Thank you, Darnell. And last but not least, we'll throw it over to Daniel Torres, CEO of a really cool brand, Mari Iwana, which is Really, we're seeing some diverse products here. We've got Moon, which is designed to be a spirit. We've got a sparkling rosier. And then we've got Mari Iwana, which has a very diverse product line that's got some fun stuff in it. Tell us about it. Thanks, Rachel. And thanks, Arcview and everyone else. Uh, hello, good afternoon. Um, Mari Iwana Beverages is actually a, a subsidiary of Mari Iwana Foods Co. Originally, when I started with a brand, I came out with the concept of making edibles uh, Mexican candy, Mexican sweet bread, but somehow, some way, somebody pulled me into the beverage category. So it's a, it's kind of a unexpected turn of events with with the brand itself. Our uh, target demographic, our our market audience is is specifically for Mexican Americans and Latinos. Obviously, everyone else is is welcome, but uh, that that's who we're going after. Beverages uh, in particular, we we really just came to market with our. Mexican flavored themed sodas, Cinco de Mayo of this year. And it's a little less than six months now, but we've managed to pull a High Times Cannabis Cup Award for, for the People's Choice for first place. So that was pretty exciting. And um, I, think, uh, I think we're gonna stick around in the beverage category for a little longer and see what we can come up with in terms of innovation. Vertosa is our, our partner with the Emulsion and we're, we're happy to be working with them. Um, I mean, in a nutshell, that's basically where we're at. So thanks for having us. All right. Thank you, Daniel. And that's a perfect segue because as we heard from Kelly and Hoodie Analytics earlier, this is a very quickly growing space, but the fact is it didn't really exist a couple of years ago. Um, and a large part of the fact that the cannabis beverage category is so successful is due to people like Ben and Vertosa. So Ben, I'm going to start with you. What is the technological advancement that has allowed the cannabis beverage category to flourish so quickly? Sure. Um, I don't know if I can take all that credit, but, uh, it's, you know, it's, it definitely takes a village. And, and one thing we realized very early on that we knew beverage was going to be a thing. Like we all, I mean, I see Darnell, I see you picking up your beverage. I saw Daniel picking up his, like beverage is a part of our life. And, and we just know it's an eventuality with cannabis. Um, but what we also know about beverage categories in general is they're, they're built on scale and, and trusted partners. And, and anyone that has tried a, an old, a beverage of, of you know, the, the old days, right? Um, I, I used to refer to them as kind of like liquid edibles. There, there was always something going on there. Yeah, they could get you high. You didn't know exactly when or how, but um, it was there. And the, the flavor was, you know, no offense to anyone that was forging the path in the early days. I, I, I got to say, like, we now work with a lot of, um, you know, the older brands that, that did forge the path for us and we're really grateful. But um, what became really important was stability, consistency, compatibility, like understanding the manufacturing process and, and really be able to do so at scale. Um, you know, there's a number of different ways to infuse a product. Uh, we specialize in nano emulsions. Um, you know, that's taking the oil droplets and breaking them down really small and suspending them in a beverage. When you go through the manufacturing process and then put it into a product and then set it on a shelf, there's a lot of different things that you have to consider. And so if you want that customer experience to be the same every time, it takes a lot of considerations, a lot of science. And, and that wasn't really done up until say three or four years ago. Um, and because it wasn't really required and, and, and people hadn't really come into the space. And we actually see history kind of like repeating itself right now, which is really interesting. Um, I don't know if anyone 
probably most people on this call are tracking kind of like uh, what's happening up in Minnesota right now um, with this kind of like freewheeling uh, market that has been created on the, on the hemp derived compound side. And we know um, that there's a lot of products on the market that they might have five or 10 milligrams or whatever they're reporting uh, when they hit the market, uh, but it's not staying that way. And, and things might be coagulating like inside the, the packaging and until regulations really hit and the requirements are there, that will likely persist, right? And so um, really our company was born out of necessity and we didn't want great brands like, you know, like Jamie's or Darnell's or, or Daniel's to, to really suffer that. And they, we wanted them to worry about building the brand, building the flavor and building the, cons you know, the consumer audience. And, um, you know, the, the, the technology is out there and there's many different ways to do it. All I, all, I, all I impress upon people is to make sure that you really know who you're working with, you know, make sure that they have a track re record. You know, people in the cannabis industry historically have like to oversell themselves <laughs> um, and continue to do so. And um, I'll just repeat a piece of advice that was given to me when I first entered the space uh, back in 2015. It's really know your partners, like really know their credibility, do reference checks, like check the science, make it, make them prove it. If they start to stutter and they don't re immediately return with uh, the proof, you know, um, then, then follow your gut. Very good advice. Thank you for that, Ben. And I think that's a really good um, conversation point around what both the consumer set and we as an industry need to understand and know about cannabis beverages. This technology is new. These products are new. The consistency is still a mile marker people are hoping to achieve. So what do consumers and investors and businesses need to know broadly about cannabis beverages? Jamie, would you like to chime in on the consumer front? Um, absolutely. So I think from the consumer standpoint, it's really important to know like how these beverages work in the first place and how they kind of compare to different categories. Because I know this is a question that I get all the time is when I drink a beverage, like how am I supposed to feel versus smoking a vape or something else? So I think when it comes to cannabis infused drinks, um, you know, these, these products are ingested and metabolized um, similar to edibles, but they do tend to have a higher bioavailability rate than other types of products that fall into the oral consumption category. And this is due to the interaction of um, the beverage in, um, with the sublingual gland in your mouth. So as the cannabinoids are interacting with your mouth, and then as Ben was touching on with Vertosa, now that we have this nano emulsion technology um, that's developing, bioavailability rates for drinks is getting so much faster, um, almost like the same experience that you would get from drinking a, wine, a glass of wine or a traditional beer. Um, so those, those effects do set in very, very quickly, um, which is exciting. But one thing to remember too, is when you're consuming any type of edible or drinkable, um, THC is metabolized through the liver. So during this process, Delta-9 THC is actually being converted into something called 11-hydroxy THC, which is a completely different compound that's actually formed by the human body and not by the plant itself. Um, so when this happens, you might have stronger and longer lasting effects than you might get from, you know, smoking a vaporizer or using some other types of cannabis products. But when you're consuming beverages, especially at these low doses that we're seeing, like I said before, you're really kind of having that same experience as you'd get as, you know, that glass of wine that you're going to have at the end of the night. Um, so really, it's just kind of knowing your perfect dose. And of course, when you're consuming these beverages too, you're not really getting those negative side effects of alcohol either. So I think it's just important to understand kind of the basics um, before you explore this category. It's definitely so essential for consumers to learn the basics in terms of the onset and the duration of the way cannabis beverages will affect them as opposed to traditional edibles and smokables and other ingested forms. Um, Darnell, what about the investor side? What do investors and people looking to get into the cannabis beverage space need to know? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think one of the things I talk to investors about, and especially VCs, I mean, I, I'm a VC on the flip side of the coin myself. And so I get the timetables that right VCs look for returns. I, I, would, I would probably caution most investors that you need to expand your horizon a bit when you think about beverages, right? 
with form factors like what Moon is doing, what Jamie's doing, what Daniel's doing, what Ben and his team are making possible, right? We are just going into a new kind of stratosphere of what's possible. And so we're early. And right, a lot of times when I talk to people about Moon, they're like, wait, what? You mean I can have a margarita or a Paloma just as I would if I was using a bottle of tequila? Yes, you can. And it takes a while, right, for people to get that. I think back to the previous point we we're just talking about, right? I think we'll get to this a bit. And I think is, you know, one of the things we can take from traditional industry is, right, the drink responsibly uh, kind of approach, right? And, and that kind of uh, self uh, accountability uh, to experimenting, right? I think everybody on this uh, panel will probably, you know, know that we say start low and go slow. And, right, so for a consumer, it's important, right, to experiment and learn with how it affects you. We've had a long time to figure out how alcohol affects us all. Um, we just haven't had the same amount of time. So investors, you know, back to the original question, investors just need to understand that, right, the horizon at which you need to look at is much broader than maybe a typical investment you might make, um, right? We are still at the very infant stages of route to market and infrastructure for beverages across the country, especially as it relates to infused beverages, uh, to retail distribution points will continue to grow. So as an investor, you're gonna have to have some patience um, as that infrastructure develops is, is really what, what I say to most people who are looking to put, put capital in the space. That's a really excellent point. And uh, I think anybody who's spent any amount of time in cannabis broadly knows that there are pain points everywhere. But specifically for cannabis beverages, there are a lot of challenges across the entire supply chain uh, before we're able to even reach point of sale. Um, does anybody want to chime in and share a little bit of insight about what some of those challenges are and maybe how we can work to resolve them as an industry? Um. I'll go ahead and take a crack at it. Uh, we, we, we operate across many of the uh, legal markets in, in North America. Um, what I would say is the sophistication of each supply chain uh, varies greatly, right? The, 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 like California, I think, California and Canada really got a head start and really started going through some of the growing pains of understanding what it was to have this, um, you know, trusted supply chain partners, right? Where you have co-packers that, just focus on the manufacturing. You have ingredient manufacturers that just focus on the technology. And then you have the brands that layer on top. Every time a new state legalizes, you know, we're going out and trying to map about, you know, who's coming online, who are going to be the trustworthy operators. Do they actually know what they're doing? And so you have to be really prepared to just like pepper with questions or at least rely on people that are, are know how to, you know, ask those questions. Um, but, you know, there's, in some cases, like, you know, Massachusetts, we've had a lot of great uh, beverage operators jumping in the space and creating co-packers and, and they know about dissolved oxygen. They know about different like homogenization methods or, or uh, carbonation levels and, and that kind of stuff. But, you know, right next door or in a different state, you might run into a manufacturer that knows none of that. And they just, they bought the equipment, they talked to a consultant and there's a lot of growing pains. And, you know, to startups, uh, all those growing pains are, are cycles in the business and it costs money and time and it can, you know, one bad partnership can, can really be the death nail to a, to a company. So, you know, just be very careful, make sure you're, you're partnering with the right people. I, I'm probably going to say partner like <laughs> 10 times as, as we go throughout this, this chat. That is a very important point. Um, and what about the retail level? What are some of the challenges associated with even getting space on the retail shelf in California or other markets? Oh yeah, I mean, shelf space is always an issue for beverages. And I think, you know, as we're looking at these 750 bottles that some products have, um, large boxes of drinks, it is very competitive to get into a dispensary. And a lot of times the dispensaries don't have a ton of room to work with. So it is challenging um, to find those right dispensaries that can actually get your, your brand out there. And then also with beverages specifically, you know, not every dispensary has refrigeration. Um, so we're not, I mean, I think this is changing slowly. I, I'm starting to see more and more dispensaries have refrigeration, which is great, um, but we're really not seeing that many yet. So I think as you are a consumer and you're going into these dispensaries, you're not really kind of getting that chilled beverage, it, like grab and go experience that you would get at the grocery store or liquor store. So I think 
um, yeah, shelf space has always been a challenge and even just some delivery services too. Um, I've heard, you know, they don't want to carry the heavy bottles. And <laughs> so I think that's definitely a challenge that we all face um, in this category. And I, I know some retail or some brands are coming up with creative solutions to that. Daniel, do you want to share a bit maybe what well, you're working on? Yeah, I was going to just touch on the retail side of it. I think a lot of it is educating these stores because beverage is, is such a, a nascent category is educating them that it's another source of, of income stream for the store itself, especially with income levels of, of, uh, of people, you know, dropping or coming down. Uh, beverages are a cheaper way to, to I still at least sell some product or uh, capitalize on a, a, a flower purchase, you know, an, an add-on sale that can increase their upselling. Um, a good example, though, is in educating, uh, there was a store that I visited a couple of weeks ago where the, the manager was like, well, we, you know, we don't do too good with beverages. And I'm looking over at the beverage refrigerator and they had their Starbucks coffee and their lunch in there and not very much product. So I, I had to tell them, I'm like, well, look, man, from my perspective, you don't, you're not, you're not even trying to sell. You have your lunch and your, your coffee in, in the fridge. That fridge is on however many hours of the day, actually 24 hours a day, plugged in, costing you money. You need to be generating money out of that fridge because the electricity charge, the space, it's already there. All it takes is for you to stock a couple of beverages and, and see for yourself that it will make you money. So a lot of it is, is educating the retailers and getting them accustomed to, to the category that they're already used to. You know, Ben mentioned, I had a drink in my hand. Um, you know, Darnell had a drink in his hand as ben, Benjamin was sipping his drink. We're already, without even thinking about it, beverage consumers, the, the retail side of things there, you know, in, in general, it's fairly new category. It's retail itself is fairly new. It's just a matter of educating them and letting them know that you can make money off of beverages. Yeah. Absolutely. Can I, can I jump on that a little bit in the sense of, you know, at the retail level, I think it, it's like to, to Jamie and Daniel's point, like it's a big thing when someone gets a, a coal box and, you know, then I look at them and I say, hey, guys, you know, there are a, a class of beverages that are coming out that are shelf stable and don't need a cold box. So I think there's just some evolution that's going to have to continue to happen on the resale on the retail side from merchandising to right. The retail net, the retail system was built for flour. Flour has been so dominant. So if you go into most retail locations, of course, they're set up for flour. But what I always try to talk to dispensary owners about is. Where beverage is a net new customer in your store a lot of times because it might be someone who walks in who doesn't want to vape or doesn't want to smoke flour, but wants a way in and, and beverages represent that way in. And, you know, we spent a lot of time on the, on the retail side of it, but I get their pain too, because for beverages, we even, if you go back up the chain to distribution, we have huge problems there, right? To Jamie's earlier point, the weight of the product, the space it takes up. Right. We just don't have the infrastructure to get it to market efficiently in many cases. So, right, the, the, the supply is sporadic at the retail location. We're already an infinitesimal part of it. And so it just takes more work for us to right, educate and show how this can be uh, additive to your current retail mix. And that's what we're all passionate about working on. I know all three of us do that every day. Um, and so we're chipping away, but, it, you know, it, I won't sugarcoat it and say it's easy for a beverage for root to market at this point. It's just not, you know. Absolutely. And I think um, I saw something in the comments about uh, interstate commerce, of course, and interstate manufacturing not really being an option and having to set everything up vertically within each new market is obviously a financial and operational burden for a lot of brands as we go to market. And we've talked about how that then trickles down all the way through distribution and into retail. Um, and we've also talked about the true culture of beverages that exists as humans, but there's a place where we haven't been able to really fully explore beverages, and that's in the on-premise space and bringing beverages to life in hospitality. And that's something that I'm working on and that I'm really passionate about. And I would love to hear your guys' perspective on how, as on-site consumption and, on and cannabis hospitality spaces advance and grow, how is that going to reach this, uh, help this category reach new heights? I, I think I can touch on that. Um, with with the advancement of the nano emulsion that Ben and his team and a couple other companies out there are providing, 
that instantaneous um, reaction to, to the beverage itself is going to benefit the on-site consumption model, I think, greatly because it's going to more closely mimic what alcohol and, and that industry does for, for the end user, and they're going to be familiar with it. So I think um, nano emulsion is going to play a big part where you can consume on site and feel the effects almost immediately. I swear I'm not paying him to, to say all that, but uh, uh, it, it is the like the the social consumption environment that convinced me to, to start Vertosa, right? Um, I remember we were playing with some of the early prototypes and, and taking them to, to social engagements and people were trying it and really having an incredible experience, like putting down the alcoholic beverage, giving incredible feedback, calling the next morning and be like, I had a great time last night. I'm not hungover. Like that was the best party ever. And these were like people in their 60s and 70s trying cannabis for the very first time. And that's when the light bulb really went off. And, you know, as we see states like, you know, New York coming online that has an incredible nightlife and, you know, it's top of mind for them. Like that is when like the, the flywheel is really going to start kicking over because really people just have to be given access to the cannabis beverage, right? They, they don't, you know, the, the, the broad the broad population doesn't even know it exists or what it is, but when they try it, and that's the nice thing about the beverage format. Like you can just try it and you can feel the effects really quickly and, and decide whether you want to continue or not, whether it's for you or not. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm just super excited about what's coming down the pike as far as the social consumption. Yeah. And I'd say, you know, it's really just, I always say this thing, it's about liquid to lips. I can talk to someone until I'm blue in the face about moon, but until they actually try it, it, it just there's a light bulb that goes off. So, so difficult for us to get liquid to lips as it is now with, you know, regulations being as they are. So, right, the social consumption uh, angle is a huge benefit to us to get liquid to lips. And I think, uh, you know, Arbase, Marijuana, like they'll both tell you that the key is to get folks to, to try it and sample it and trial it. And it's super difficult right now. So we hope this uh, opens up new pathways for us and, and hopefully just the beginning. I know, you know, there's going to be some clamoring from the traditional side of the space. Why can't we have access to cannabis beverages, uh, especially as people get more comfortable with them? So I'm hoping social consumption is just the tip of the, the iceberg. Yeah, I agree. And I think these on-site consumption places will also help normalize cannabis as we're continuing to see these lounges open up. And it also gives us a way to really customize the guest experience, like similar that you'd see at like a tasting room in the Napa Valley. Um, we can actually interact with guests and have them taste the product, just like Darnell was saying. And that's just so important for any type of beverage is having that ability to serve your beverage, have the guests taste it and really be able to tell your story. So I think on-site consumption is definitely um, going to be a game changer for sure. I, I certainly agree with all of you on that. And because I am working on one of these projects, I'll take a moment to wax poetic uh, because I also firmly believe that not only will these spaces allow for consumer normalization, but they will also allow for the advancement of the cannabis industry more broadly and certainly in the development of a more professional career path outside of just your standard, standard bud tender. Um, where there's a really, really high turnover, um, but tenders are only working at these accounts for two months or something like that. And so when we're able to develop a professional career path for a bud tender who's able to act like a sommelier, act like a master mixologist, and be able to really craft a program and help their guests understand, not only do these products exist, let's explore this category fully, let's explore it in a cannabis cocktail, let's have an RTD, let's have a michelada. There's you know all of the various form factors that we're used to in traditional beverage 100% apply to cannabis beverages. So um, I think that that's going to be really exciting as we watch the advancement of that cannabis professional path as well. Um, but speaking of these various types of products and the cultures attached to them, um, we have the culture of wine here. We have the culture of mixology and the culture of Mexican uh, beers and drinking those products. And so how can we bring other cultures and traditional beverage cultures into cannabis beverages as we move forward as an industry? I'll take this one. I mean, so I spent a, a large part of my my professional career 
actually doing this kind of segmentation work to understand the, the states in which people enjoy beverages, right? It's how we found white space for new beverages. I, I kind of think of it, it broadly, and it, it, this may be a little bit tangential to cultures per se, but I think of things in terms of occasions, right? Beverage has occasions, right? There's connecting with friends, there's uh, socializing around food, there is uh, the big game, there is uh, the girls' night out, there's relaxing at home, right? There's so many different unique occasions that beverage plays such a central part in that right, it's our job and it's incumbent upon us, you know, as the brands is to really start to think about how do we exist in those moments? And, and really that's how we should present ourselves to consumers, right? So to now, like everything is such a, you know, people think of cannabis infused beverages as this monolithic thing, right? Like it's like tea, it's cannabis infused, it's, but there's so many different angles of infused beverages that play in different uh, social settings and different occasions, right? You might have a can that's easier to take to a tailgate. You have a 750 ml bottle that looks great on your back bar. Right. You, there's just so many different places we go with it. And so I do think we have um, an ultimate opportunity to um, really create a place for ourselves in all these traditional occasions where beverage is important. And, you know, that's I think what we're doing with with all the form factors, you, you know, you're starting to see come to market. Yeah, and I just to add something um, onto that is cannabis infused beverages are truly a perfect alternative to alcohol. So when creating Urbasi, we really wanted to create this product for wine drinkers. And we wanted to have that sophistication, the elegance, everything that you would want in that traditional glass of wine, we want to bring that to you, um, but cannabis infused. And of course it's non-alcoholic, but anytime you think of enjoying a glass of wine, like we want you to be able to enjoy some Arbasi during that time too. So whether it's during dinner, happy hour, brunch, um, or even just to unwind at the end of the day, um, you know, you can actually substitute a cannabis beverage in as you would for any other type of drink. So it's, it's, I think it integrates into like, it could integrate into everyone's life really. I just wanted to touch again on what Jamie said earlier about uh, normalizing, not just cannabis, but specifically cannabis beverages. And what we, what we're trying to do over at Marijuana Beverages is give it a broad stroke. So, you know, we have the Mexican sodas, we have the Michelada cups that you can mix with alcohol or not. Um, and we also have plans later on down the line to do various uh, drinks that people are more accustomed to, like a cold brew coffee, um, an energy drink. So we're, we're really trying to cater to a broader audience in the sense of not just sticking to one skew. And I think that's gonna help kind of make it easier for people to approach the cannabis beverage category when they can see, you know, if they don't see something that they're used to drinking normally, but they all of a sudden there's a skew that comes out that they are familiar with. And that may very well be the introductory drink that they bring in and come into the category with. Yeah, and, and if, I, if I can jump in just a bit and talk about kind of the, the different types of consumers that we're seeing in space and how we're serving them from an ingredient perspective, you know, there, there is kind of the, the, the brand and the products and the flavors that speak to certain demographics, but there's also the sophistication of the cannabis consumer. And so sometimes you just need THC or CBD in a product and you want it to be fast acting and predictable. Um, but of course we have, you know, the, the true to the plant consumers where they want more of a full spectrum or, or specialized cannabinoids and, and we're also doing that on the ingredient side, but taking it to another dimension, we're also starting to look forward and be like, you know, what are the types of ingredients that people really want to put in their bodies? Not only the experience, but, you know, is it plant derived? Is it, is it organic? You know, like we can do all that with the ingredients that, that we're developing. And, and, you know, right now it's not a huge part of the market that is really focusing on, on all those little constituents and even labeling practices don't always require it. Um, but it is where the puck is going and, and you know, um, you know, that, that's what we're providing to the industry. So it's like, if you want a certified organic plant, or, you know, um, you know, humble, sun-grown, full spectrum live rosin into a beverage, you know, that's going to speak to a certain segment and, and that's the flexibility that we're trying to give. Um, but we are seeing that in the market and it's really exciting to start seeing that segmentation and, and what, what, what's getting left. 
it's really exciting to see how all of these various form factors and categories are coming together to provide products for all different types of consumers. Um, I think cannabis beverages is probably one of the easiest entry points for the can of curious and the new consumer because um, not only because many of the offerings are in low dose and obviously have the shorter uh, duration and the more rapid onset, um, but because as we've said many times, everyone here knows how to drink and is very um, comfortable with a beverage of all kinds in hand. Uh, that said, with traditional beverage slowly encroaching into this space, we've seen a bunch of brands popping up recently uh, that are owned by some traditional beverage brands. And I, uh, I know that the alcohol industry has been eyeing this segment for a really long time. Uh, what do we think the future of this looks like as those players start moving more fully into cannabis beverages and as federal decriminalization, descheduling, whatever that ends up looks like rolls out? What's, what do we think the future of the category looks like? You know, I think, I think oh, <laughs> go, go ahead, Daniel. <laughs> um, I was going to say, I think further acceptance of of the of the cannabis beverage sector, I think it's going to open up um, doors for opportunity for for people that maybe weren't aware of it. Now that we have a big player stepping in, uh, able to use their marketing power and their leverage from their prior uh, experience to to now contribute to to the space, I welcome them. You know, I see people from AB InBev looking at my stories all the time. Get that check ready because when the time comes, I I will definitely sell. Um, and I'm sure everyone else on the panel is is on the same page. Yeah, yeah. So, so I was going to say the same thing. Like the 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 marketing push is great for the segment, right? It just it it earns everybody a little bit of social credit. Uh, what I will say from the brand's perspective, you know, we we work with a number of the of those big brands, and it's a level playing field once they're in. You know, they face all the same challenges, and and in some cases, it's even more of a shock to them. It's like, oh, I actually have to get out there. I have to pound the pavement. I have to go shake hands. I have to talk to the bud tenders. Like. Being a big brand, you know, it might get your foot in the door, but you got to do the same hard work, right? And so if you look at the the numbers and headset or or any of the other data platforms, like just look who the top sellers are, right? It it's not the the big brands that have been been grabbing the headlines. Uh they could do it, but it's gonna take the same hard work and the same positioning that you know Moon and Urbas Urbasi and, and Madri Iwana are, are are doing. Yeah, I can tell you coming from that space, like this, this isn't a secret, right? To the folks on the other side, they've predicted this coming for a decade now. Um, most of them are cautiously uh, just watching, uh, is what I'll say. Um, I talk to peers all the time at all the companies I mentioned, and they certainly have an eye on us. Um, but at the same time, right, they talk in terms of federally permissible event is, is one trigger. And I think the second trigger is they're just fine allowing us to figure out this hard part and they'll swoop in when a lot of the uh, infrastructure things are worked out. So it's a timing thing. Um, they're in no rush, right? They have pockets that are orders of magnitude the size of any of the larger players in cannabis. So it's, it, they have dry powder, as you say. Um, they know about us. Um, and it, I just think when they get their hands on it is when you'll see it move out of beyond dispensaries, beyond consumption lounges. You'll see it move into on-premise environments, especially the low dose options. Uh, and I think one day you'll probably in local BevMo, you'll probably see a, a infused beverage uh, aisle. Um, I wouldn't put it past where this is all going. So I think it's, again, it's just a matter, it's time and it's, if you want that to happen tomorrow, probably in the wrong industry, right? But I say this is going to go the way of a smartphone. In 20 years from now, we're going to be like, duh, right? Like, we always had this. So um, that's that. That's my hope for the industry. And I think, too, when the time comes, when these big players do come in, I think there will be benefits because they do already have these natural, national distribution channels set up already. Um, so I think there could be a lot of benefits and they'll just continue to drive innovation as well. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in these next couple of years. hundred percent. That might be the understatement of the day, uh, specifically for cannabis beverages. 
Uh, well, we've covered a ton of topics. Is there anything that we didn't touch on panelists that you guys wanna raise a flag to, or should we open it up to a few minutes of questions? Okay, sounds like we've got some time for some questions. If there's anything um, anybody watching wants to know, you've got a great group of experts here. So now's your chance. I I'll go ahead and while, while people get their questions in, I, I did see a technical question in there regarding the, the nano emulsions. And um, so my general answer to that is like we we have developed a, an entire portfolio of different formulas for, for different uses and applications. Uh, droplet sizes, which really can influence uh, the bioavailability, uh, range anywhere from, you know, 20 nanometers on up to call it 400 nanometers. Um, Regardless, if you're in that range, like it's going to be a relatively fast onset that you can feel that initial peak. I mean, sometimes you get the psychosomatic effect, you know, as soon as it hits your lips, right? Like you're, you're getting, and you know, some people have postulated that that could be the influence of the terpenes and other ingredients, but you know, five to 10 minutes is generally what we say as far as that initial onset with a peak absorption in the 30 to 45 minute range. And we do, um, anyone that wants documentation, we have human blood studies that, that we've done to kind of really track that. Obviously, we're talking about cannabis, you know, your own biology, whether you're fasted or fed, um, can all influence the experience. Um, although we're working on technologies to help, kind of help isolate that and, and make it even more consistent. That was, that was for uh, Gagan. <laughs> all right. Uh, and I think we had some questions about the FDA perspective on beverage ingestibles. Um, I know we've seen a lot about the FDA and CBD food and beverage products in particular. So does anybody want to chime in on that? Or maybe what we're seeing with some of these alternative cannabinoids, the hemp derived D8 and D9 products that uh, are rolling out all over the place? <laughs> um, I'll start. Just I, I, I've been relatively outspoken about it. Um, it's, it's, it is the wild West, right? Uh, there, there was a while there where we had pretty definitively cannabis and then hemp. Um, and there's this gray area that has kind of proliferated in between and is like expanding exponentially. Um, there are many ways to derive and create cannabinoids. And there are many laws that people are like navigating in different ways. Um, all I can say is again, you know, trust your partners and only trust your partners through validating and, and proving. Um, if someone says it's D9 that's derived from hemp, ask them how. Ask for the COAs. Like, go and get it tested yourself. We, um, Minnesota, I mentioned earlier, it, like, if you're watching LinkedIn, there's new beverages popping up left and right. And I mean, in response to a law that was enacted, you know, a month or two ago, like, you know, the, the, the rigor hasn't really been pressed on a lot of these products. We've started uh, evaluating a lot of materials from those supply chains, and they're like, "Yeah, it's hemp derived D nine, and and we send it to our trusted labs, and it's like, there's no peak on D nine. There's a peak on delta ten. There's some other uh, isomers that are popping up. What about you know solvents that are being used for that conversion if they are converted cannabinoids from CBD? There's just a lot of questions that need to be asked, and um, I have a lot of thoughts on it. There are good materials out there. There are good manufacturers. There are people that are even synthesizing ingredients not from the plant that can be pure and clean. It's just, you have to know and you have to trust someone that knows the science to, to kind of really help navigate it. Absolutely. And I, I'm wondering if anybody also has any thoughts as to whether or not the uh, cannabis beverage category will ultimately fall under FDA regulation um, as federal legalization moves forward. I think it would I think it would have to, right? If it's um if it's a beverage once um you know once it goes federally legal they're going to put it under some governing body. I think FDA would be the the most uh obvious one, but um again, how far out we're at we how far out we are is uh it's no telling. Yeah. Yeah, there's been some talk of uh you know the TTB or the you know control board uh, having a hand in it. So to Daniel's point, it's going to be somewhere. We just don't know where it's going to fall yet. Uh, is probably what I'd say. We we as an industry probably better hope that it does go the way of the TTB and that the FDA's involvement is purely to ensure that we're 
running clean facilities and, and clean processes and that all the facilities are GMP certified. If it truly does uh, go under the FDA like the CAOA um, you know, proposed, I think we would find ourselves in, in a very even more highly regulated environment that could, could take a long time to get products to market. Um, Nancy Mace, who is the, the young Republican that, that submitted the, the alternative legalization bill this year, um, it, it, it kind of slotted it more under TTB, treat it more like alcohol, which I think would be much more uh, palatable for us to, to navigate. Absolutely. And I think uh, obviously that experience with controlled substances is going to go a long ways in smoothing that transition. Uh, okay, so I think we maybe have time for one last question. Um, how do we feel that distribution across state lines, maybe um, in, on the Western state block or something like what Gavner Newsom has just proposed, how might that affect the ability for this segment to expand? Open opens up the door to more customers. I think it would be a, a great thing if, if, uh, if in fact that does happen. I mean, here in California, we're, we're kind of blessed with the population being such uh, high as it is, but if, if we can reach a couple states nearby via distribution, um, I'm personally all for it. More, more, uh, more customers to sell to. Yeah, absolutely. And we get emails all the time from people that aren't located in California that want these types of products. So if we were able to um, ship maybe one day or even just go across state lines, I think that would be um, very important for this. Like I know in the wine industry too, they can ship wine direct. So hopefully we'll be able to do that uh, with cannabis. <laughs> Awesome. So I'm going to hop in here as your little hostess with the mostest. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you to all of the panelists. You guys were incredible. We are already getting a great response to this in the chat. So thank you everybody for being here. I just also want to thank the 30,000 of you that have watched our few programs since 2020. We also have a quick marketing poll that we're going to drop out there. So if you have some time, it's just one quick question. Ask about your marketing challenges. So before we go, I'd like to announce some upcoming events. In October, we will be doing the ArcView Access Cannabis Investment Summit, and that will be a convene at 42nd and Park. Please join us. It's the return to in-person. Then in November, we have two webinars. We have Make Marketing Moves on November 3rd and on November 10th. Not conflicting with MJ Biz, we have hiring highs and lows. So please join us to hear about cannabis hiring. Then last but not least, in December, we have the Cannabis Investment Summit in Coral Gables. Join us. We're putting the events link in the chat. And that's it. Thank you, everyone. Bye.